focusing on timbre, phenomenology, and critical organology. When she isn't on the road, she is based in sunny Los Angeles. Uh, it is my privilege and great pleasure and my honor to introduce Sarah DeFacci. <laughs> Thank you. So let's get let's get to some questions. So first of all, as I mentioned, you're on tour, right? And you, you have a show tomorrow night. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this is part of your uh, one of your solo electronic sets. Yeah, this I try to increasingly more and more with each tour. I try to do a mix of different things to keep it interesting for myself, I guess. Um, okay. but I also do a bunch of different types of things. So, yeah, the, the one in Barcelona, which is where I am, is uh, yeah, just a solo electronic set. That's great because well, when I was looking at the your your list of dates and locations, I noticed that you're playing solo electronic sets. You're also playing solo organ sets, right? And mm -hmm. then you're also collaborating with musicians. Mm -hmm. So I have to wonder, you know, you kind of already got into it a little bit. You're talking about how it keeps it interesting for you, uh, but uh, how are these three different forms of live performance and dialogue for you? I mean, I, this is kind of a thing that's always been the case for me like I you know in both I guess more specifically in in the records that I do but increasingly more in the live domain mm. um, that it to me it all feels like it's coming from the same place it's just my music is very like timbrely like instrument oriented and I feel like whether it's coming from electronic instruments or from a pipe organ or from string instruments that somebody else is playing it all comes from the same place. It's just like a different iteration of it. So to me, it just feels like an expanded way of, of thinking about the same ideas that I would be. It just turns out in a different way because of the instrumentation. I see. So one of your kind of primary compositional strategies, like seems to focus around timbre and the, in, the instrumentation. Um, so I wonder if, is uh, improvisation a part of like how you approach the composition structurally or do you have another kind of uh, mode? Yeah, I mean, it, it also varies based on whether I'm doing something recorded or whether it's something live and it varies within that as well. But there's always some element of not necessarily improvisation, but like openness to, to having different structures be open to turning out in different ways at any given mm -hmm. moment. Um, one thing that I do a lot that I'm doing at a lot of the more chamber stuff that I've been working on lately with other players is allowing them some opportunities to make decisions. Like I'll give them a few different notes to choose from and they can choose in any given moment, which of those notes they're going to play. Hmm. So it, it makes the performances different and it gives it this element of, the players having to actually listen to what's going on and kind of respond to it in the moment um, and not just, you know, have it be this dialed in thing where like, okay, you're playing this note, then you're playing this note and, and giving them some options about how things happen and when they happen so that the piece can kind of happen in this acoustic way. That's been kind of interesting to me. So, yeah, I, I think that's like an element. You could call that an element of improvisation. Sure. Well, it also sounds like um, perhaps uh, in, in engineering surprise is is one of the uh, ways that you you know keep yourself interested in what's happening and you can kind of create relationships with not only other musicians but the instrument itself. Um, so, for instance, like if you're using some of these older instruments, I imagine sometimes they have uh, unexpected behavior. Yeah, I mean, when I do pipe organ sets, it's it's so specific. Like I have to have a like three hour rehearsal before I do the concert every time because wow. I have pieces and things that I can bring to the instrument, but every single time it's a different instrument. So I have to just see what it can do. But I also like to take advantage of that and actually make a piece that's specific for that instrument and for that space. Um, you know, something that wouldn't be able to be performed on any other instrument. Okay, so make, let's make sure I'm getting this correctly. So you'll show up at a church with a giant organ, uh -huh. and then you'll take you'll have a sort of a, a composition already in mind for what you're going to perform that evening, and then you in three hours kind of see how it meshes, and then you also make alterations to the composition to incorporate some of these idiosyncrasies of these different instruments that you're. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wow. That's right. <laughs> I imagine that does keep it interesting for you. Yeah. Uh, 
the, yeah, I mean, you're always, and that kind of leads, that's the way that I work with organs because I don't have a pipe organ at home, obviously. Um, that's to me the way that composition comes out of that, exploring different organs and different the different processes that they can do and kind of over time developing different ways of playing the instrument that, that emerge from that, that then develop into pieces. I see. Well, so I know that you spent about uh, 10 years working at, for the, at the Center of Music, and this is where you encountered a lot of the, uh, these different instruments, these kind of older organs. And can you articulate like, what it is about what the organ does that, uh, that a- attracts your ear as opposed to uh, other instruments? Why, does, why is organology going to be in your dissertation? Um, well, I'll, I'll clarify. Organology is a, a general term for the study of musical instruments. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Not specific. I mean, it includes organs, obviously, but it's it's the study of musical instruments. Um, but yeah, I mean, organs, I think other people have said this when they, they talk about organs, but um, it's something I also think that the organ's basically an acoustic synthesizer. It, it works in pretty much the same way as a synthesizer and it you build sound and create sound in the same way. It's a very timbral instrument. That's a part of the, the playing of it as opposed to like a piano where a piano pretty much is going to sound like a piano unless you're doing like really out there stuff with it. Um, the organ and the synthesizer come kind of without a bass sound that you sort of come to the instrument creating that sound. Um, and I think also just the fact that the organ and the synthesizer can both sustain sound in a way that other instruments can't as easily. Right. Um, for me, that's because it, you know, the kinds of things that I want to get out of sound take time, just necessarily take time to unfold. Um, so that's a, an important aspect of, of the instrument. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was reading an um, interview with uh, Elian Radig. Actually, it was in the book Pink Noises mm-hmm. uh, by Tara Rogers. And uh, she was talking about how her music had to be like 70, 80 minutes. You know, these pieces that just like would not fit on the media at the time. Like the only way still to listen to some of her works, like you have to get a tape and, um, you know, put it on the reel to reel. And listen to it like I did at uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, not too long ago. So, like, w- what is it about the instrument that demands this longevity um, uh, for you? Yeah, I mean, I think again, I don't know if it's. I think it's that the instrument create like allows for that, um, but it it really just facilitates the the listening process that that just needs to to take time to be able to, first of all, have the listener get into the state of mind where they can actually pay attention to these kinds of things that are going to come out in the sound, and then to actually be able to perceive them. Um, It just takes time for it to happen and to really fill the space and and create this other way of listening um, that isn't just this surface level, like this is the note that you're hearing right now. This is the note that you're hearing right now. Like if you jump into an Elian Radik piece halfway through, it's not going to be the same as if you started listening to it from the beginning and went kind of on that journey and ended up in that place, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, when you play live, and I'm responding to what you're saying about this period of adjustment that has to take place, are you taking that into consideration? Like what you do at the top of the set um, is is to kind of invite this uh, this uh, transition to take place somehow? Yeah, absolutely. And I, when I play live, um, I think I've mentioned this in interviews before and I've been criticized for it, but it works for me. So it's what I do is I, <laughs> I, I am a timer on my cell phone. Um, and in my scores, I have things kind of laid out with rough, like this should happen around this time, by this time, this should be happening, you know, these sort of rough directives of, of actual time based things. And for me, you know, I come from a classical background, I grew up playing piano, in this way that when you're performing, you often feel this sense of like, I need to rush, I need to things need to happen in a faster, you're so aware of it happening at a different pace. And Mm so when I have an actual clock telling me how long something's been happening, I feel like I can let go of that and just know that like, you know, when I did this in my studio, two minutes was the length that made sense for it to happen. So I know that I'm just going to let it happen for two minutes. And it's Mm -hmm. the same with the audience that like, whether they like it or not, whether they're uncomfortable, 
it's going to happen for that period of time and they're just going to have to deal with it. And that, I think that helps because people do get, people are just uncomfortable listening to things, you know, with, with nothing else happening. So to me, I, I kind of like to almost exaggerate it a little bit to in a live situation because I can to just let it go on a little bit longer than people feel like they want it to so that it forces them to kind of let go of that. Things need to change. Something else needs to happen. I'm uncomfortable, you know? Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit into my questions because I think you're bringing up an issue that is, I think, really vital, not just for understanding your work, but for uh, a lot of the work that we're going to see in the documentary. Uh, So I'll skip uh, to you know, uh, to talking about Pauline Oliveros a little bit, who's featured in the film, um, because I kind of see a little bit of a kinship here where with Pauline in the film, she talks about how her work um, developed somewhat in response to the Vietnam War, in particular, her uh, compositional strategy uh, or life philosophy, really, of deep listening. And uh, and, and as a result, it, it does contain this this socio political dimension to it. Like um, Pauline talks about, as we'll see, that there is this like political aspect to taking the time and clearing the space in order to uh, take in uh, the, uh, the the auditory aspects of the environment. Um, and I, I wonder if do you, do you also consider that uh, your work has this uh, political aspect to it, or or could you could see how maybe it could be read this way. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, it, you know, there isn't anything specific. I wouldn't say to me that I'm putting into the work. That's not to say that there are things that people can't get out of it. Um, I think that's just the way that it works and it should work that way. But yeah, there's definitely, I would say more of like a, I don't know, societal is not exactly the right word. And like, spiritual is also not the right word but like maybe something in between that (laughs) I don't know of like this this feeling that you know there's just there's something that happens to you when you're able to listen and there's something that is good when you're able to slow down and and just go into this different way of thinking and it's I don't know it's hard to some some of these words like meditation and things like that have a lot of loaded they're loaded terms and they're things that I don't feel comfortable co-opting necessarily to talk about my music, but I think it's kind of the same. It, it, it has a function that, that serves in the same way that I'm aware of when I'm working on the music that does it for me. And that's why I make the music that I do. Um, but it also is something that I try to impart for the listener um, as much as that's possible. Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting. And, in, in Houston, there's this series called the Nameless Sound series, and they they feature n- new music, a lot of uh, free improvisation meets kind of experimental stuff, a lot of uh, instrumental things. Uh, y- your work would fit right in. Uh, and for some of the people, after going after you know many weeks of of seeing these free concerts on Monday, you know there was this one person that was sitting in the audience, and they said, uh, you know, this is this is my church. And, you know, there wasn't anything being proselytized or put forward or, or anything really being advocated other than um, sitting um, and being patient and, and, and waiting for, for change to come slowly. Um, not all the music was like this, but that was often the case. It was also like it demanded something of you, which kind of brings us to another topic Um Another artist featured in in this movie is uh, Marianne uh, Amache, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's actually one of my favorite sections of the film. Um, in particular, she talks about how one of her intentions is to uh, deliberately leave space for the listener to contribute. Um, and I wonder if this notion of the necessity of the hearer's participation. Does this also resonate with you and, and your work? Uh, what, does your music ask for something from the listener and what might it be? Yeah, I mean, I, I've i thought about this. Um, oh, no. Uh, oh. As well. <laughs> you got a glitch. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, yeah, part of me wonders, like, I, I guess I have a hard time imagining how the listener wouldn't 
be like how that wouldn't be the case all the time, like how the listener just wouldn't. Because to me, the way that I imagine the whole process of like music happening is like there's, you know, somebody on on the creating side or whatever that's putting it into the world for other people to experience. But then the end part of that is the experience of it. And whether it's the person making the music, playing the music, um, who's having that experience, or it's the person listening to the music, having that experience is kind of irrelevant. It's, it's just the other half of what music is. So it's, it's hard for me. I guess the short answer is yes, I, I do think of the listener as completing the experience, but I, I guess in like a philosophical way, it's hard for me to imagine a case in which that isn't happening, you know, in which there's nothing for somebody else. And I think that's the way it should be. I think that, you know, there's always things that I think about in my music that I'm putting in for me to get out of it. But, and, you know, maybe there are certain aspects of that, that I try to impart for the listener to pick up on, but I would never want to create a piece of, I think it would be so like depressing to create something that's just fixed, that only has one meaning that only everybody's going to get the same thing. It's just, it, to me, that's not how like art, I feel like it's just like a larger philosophical question about art and aesthetic experience and that kind of thing that it just, to me, it just feels like that's always the case that the, the person who's interacting with it finishes the process, you know, and it's always changing and it's always changing because it's different people who are experiencing it. And it's, you know, right. so yes, <laughs> that's, yeah. short answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, one thing that I really appreciate uh, about the kind of music that uh, you make is that, you know, you really begin to understand the 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 architecture of the space that you're in with uh, through your music. It almost becomes like this uh, this uh, echo echo location for uh, the environment that you're in, and um, you can fill that uh, space with uh, your thoughts, or you can also just become more aware of uh, the the people that you're sharing the space with, or um, or the different decisions that went into the the uh, the decorations of this particular weird old church in Brooklyn, or whatever it is. I mean, I just I really appreciate how. I feel like I have a lot of agency when I listen to your music, like you aren't necessarily trying to take over my brain. Sometimes you want that. You want someone that will just completely just uh, absolve you of any responsibility for thinking and just like completely overwhelm you with uh, stimulation and distract you from the yeah, present I mean, moment. I, yeah, I guess like maybe in a sense, like music that I experience that's a lot more physical does that for me. Um, and I, I tend, maybe that's just like the connection that I make is that I tend not to connect with music like that as much because I like having that dialogue with what's mm. happening around me. I don't like not feeling like I'm a part of it, feeling like it's happening to me. And I feel like music that's really overwhelmingly physical, um, especially a lot of minimalist music falls into that category music that's just like overtly loud to take over the mental function and just make you like physically feel something, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's a scenario that, that kind of fits for me, that letting go of agency. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to compare like uh, one of your sets to like sun, for instance, where it's just yeah. so incredibly loud and so yeah. bass heavy that like, you're just shaking violently the whole time involuntarily. It's just, um, and that's, you know, that has its own sort of catharsis and place. But your music, which can be equally loud and equally impactful, um, it doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily do that, but it uh, complements it quite well, I think. Um, yeah. I have to wonder, in in you do a lot of composing, like in your home, or do you have a studio space that exists like elsewhere, or both? I'm very lucky to. I feel like Los Angeles is one of the last major cities where you can like have space to to do things like that sure. so i have a, i have a studio in my house um like a separate little room that's my studio that's really helpful i've had different iterations of like studio 
from my bed studio in a separate building that I have to go to and none of those feel right. So it's nice to actually have like a room that's the studio where I can go into and it's it's set up in a specific way that that just works well for my personality. And if you're comfortable sharing, like how do you kind of engineer your studio space to be conducive towards creativity and, and exploration and all the things you need in order to make the music happen? I mean, really, the just for me, like everything's just set up and ready to be used. It's not, you know, when I first moved to LA, most things were like sitting not in a usable situation and it took like a while to get everything set up but now it's it's the kind of situation where you know this instrument's sitting here and if i want to use this it's very easy to just hit record and set it up so i can do something with that or turn this on and try this or whatever so it's yeah and there's you know acoustic instruments just kind of sitting around nearby so everything's just kind of accessible which works well for me is recording and then listening back to, say, an improvisation session a big part of your process? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, especially early on, that's pretty much the way that it happens is just like improvising and then seeing what comes out of that. And then if there's something that I like, taking that and developing it more. But it, yeah, it always, like 99% of the time, I would say, starts with improvisation in the studio. Is there a particular instrument, and I'm sure, you know, maybe it's changed over time, but that really in invites you to like just play with it, you know, uh, that you find like you have this almost seamless symbiosis with? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of I have like a little uh, reed organ in my studio that I use a lot that just works well for for those kinds of purposes. But in terms of electronic instruments, um, I've been using a Mellotron quite a lot. Uh -huh. And to me, the Mellotron is just like endlessly, I don't know, there, it's just, there's so much, every time I use it, there's just something that I hear in it that's new or something, just like a new way of hearing it that's really interesting to me. And there's something about the idiom of the notes and the way that it happens and the fidelity of the sound and, you know, just like the textural qualities of it that every time I turn it on, it's just, I could just sit there for like hours and just get lost <laughs> that's incredible i just want to share with the audience a mellotron correct me if i'm wrong here sarah this is a, a very a prototypical kind of synthesizer that actually used recorded sound so there's actually an array of tapes and tape heads tape read heads in this um enormous box uh that also looks like a keyboard and when you press a key, it actually plays back tape at, at varying speeds to create these sounds so you have a real one you know, not, not a, a real one. Machine. No, I have the digital, the one that Mellotron, they licensed oh, okay. the Mellotron recordings to the like new Mellotron company. So I have one of those, but it sounds, I mean, it's the original recordings and it sounds really nice and the keyboard feels nice. It feels like the closest thing to the real thing. <laughs> Yeah, and it actually works, which like the Mellotrons I hear are notoriously, uh, you know, infamous for uh, breaking down on the regular. Like you basically, you buy the Mellotron and you also buy a person to fix it for you and they just live in your studio. <laughs> Those sound a lot weird. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you listen to outside of the realm of, of art music? I mean, I kind of listen to everything i would say i feel like a lot of people have that answer maybe it feels like it's kind of like a phoned in answer or something but it's kind of true i mean i the way that i listen to things i often think that like in another life or something i would have made like a good producer because i just there's a specific way that i listen to things and i you know i'm interested in texture and timbre and layering and harmony and these kinds of things and so especially when I listen to like pop music which I you know listen to a lot of um I can't help but like it's so intricate and it's so interesting like recorded music has become so has just done so much and it's it's really inspiring to me to hear things that you know just to hear the way that people approach sound and the way that they create sound worlds in a recorded environment it doesn't really matter what type of music it is. Um, it's really interesting to me. And I, I guess maybe it's hard for me to like separate, like if I actually sat down and thought about like what type of music I just enjoy listening to, I guess that's a much narrower field, but it's, mm. 
very easy when I listen to something and I can't help but be like, wow, how did they do that? Like, what's going on there? That's interesting. So yeah, there isn't really anything that I don't find some appreciation or like joy in listening to, I would say. That's excellent. I mean, so much of modern production today seems to be concerned with timbre. So it makes sense that, you know, it, it's about creating this sound that is simultaneously familiar. I'm just talking about pop music, both familiar, but also there's something new to it. And it seems like there's millions of dollars that, of, uh, of research and in in development that goes into finding like a snare drum that's really going to evoke a you know, a certain drum machine, but it is also going to sound like have a little extra crispiness that has never been heard before. Yeah, I just think it's like so interesting. Like most people don't hear, like they, they're not aware of what they're hearing or they're, they're not aware of like how much thought and how much detail goes into the average recording. You know, you hear it, but you're like aware that it sounds a specific way, but like to really think of it in like this black box manner that like everything it's like a movie you know you look at a movie and like literally everything's fake like things that you wouldn't even imagine yeah. to be fake are fake they're not real i know this right. from living in la i'm aware that everything's fake and <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting to me when that happens in music too that like just this idea of like artificially creating environments in a recorded world specifically i guess i would say um yeah it's just like pretty fascinating i think it's an interesting way to think about interacting with sound and i think that also gives us a really good segue to the documentary tonight because you know we'll see artists like delia derbyshire and creating the doctor who theme and the amount of work that goes into it i mean the amount of sound design and the kind of the innovative practice that she had to develop pretty much from scratch in order to arrive at these different sounds um, and I think we very much see how, how much uh, the, this, the practice of these uh, uh, various artists like really informed, you know, and, and can be felt today in the way that music is made, whether it's very, very commercial or even more uh, experimental and, um, and, uh, and perhaps a little bit more uh, challenging. Um, yeah. Is... Uh, is there anything else you're drawing inspiration from that's not in the music sector these days? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's still in the music sector, but I, I, it's it's interesting to be reminded of like, you know, I think like when the pandemic started, I was very like studio oriented anyway. I, I would have defined myself as like an artist who's more studio oriented. And so initially it didn't bother me as much to be like, well, I'm just going to focus on recording and I'll get back to, you know, live stuff will happen when it does. And I kind of always thought of the live thing as being like an afterthought, like a different, a way of thinking about stuff that I was already doing. And when I went back to performing live, it w it hit me like a bus or whatever, you know, like just oh. being aware of how important that is to the way that I think about music and composition and the way that I work things out, to me, it's become more balanced. And that's still really interesting. I think about that a lot more when I work on music now, whether it's records or live music, I think about that aspect of like being in the moment and being in a space and, and that relationship and that dialogue as, as being a lot more meaningful than, than it maybe previously was to me, so. Right. So there's a feedback you get from the experience of performing live that um, really informs the compositional choices you make. Yeah, I think just also like having time and not having to like when I'm working on a record, it's so like, well, this has to happen in this amount of time because it has to fit on a vinyl record. And that's just right. the way it's going to work. And it's just so liberating to just be like, you know what, this is this needs an hour. And that's that. And maybe nobody will ever hear it outside of this concert because it's too long, but that's fine. You know? Yeah. It's, it's nice it's, to be able to change your mind and, and not have to worry about time restrictions in any way. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so great. Well, uh, is there, is there anything else you'd like to share before we move over to the film, Sarah? Uh, thank you again so much for joining us. Yeah, no, I mean, 
it's a great film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. great. Well, we're all looking forward to it. And thank you again so much for, for being here. Let's have a round of applause for Sarah yeah, Nabachi, sure. everybody. <laughs> all right. Well, wishing you the best of luck with your show tomorrow night and the rest of the tour.